Defending your intellectual property rights can be an expensive undertaking. Many patent owners simply don't have the resources to do so. But this is where Ashley Keller sees an opportunity. His company, Gershon Keller Capital, invests in the IP industry by, for example, financing patent owners in terms of their legal and regulatory risks, fees and costs, or even operating capital. And he told IM Magazine's Richard Lloyd on the sidelines of the IPBC Global Congress here in San Francisco that there are several good reasons to be in this business. So the first is, uh, patent cases, like other litigation, isn't typically correlated with the broader market, so investors tend to like that. There's no covariance in the portfolio. There's no uh, association between one case uh, and the broader markets. So if you're an investor looking to diversify away from, let's say, the S&P 500, patent litigation can be a good asset class. Um, the second reason, though, and it's related to the first, is there is a real opportunity to pick winners and losers. Um, I think particularly in this environment, which is challenging for patentees, uh, finding high quality assets is the name of the game and having the right team in place to differentiate between quality and everything else uh, is important. So uh, if you do do that properly, there are good returns to be had. You spoke then of, of, of some of the opportunities that investors see in this space and how they get comfortable with it. You've obviously been very successful in, in raising um, I think more than $800 million in assets that you, that you have. But what are some of the challenges that investors see in this space? Well, um, savvy investors and all of our investors are savvy investors. They understand that the patent landscape has shifted over the last 10 and even the last five, four, three, two years. Um, it's become more challenging to monetize IP. Uh, and the reason is the legal environment has shifted very much in a, a de defendant-friendly way. Um, you look at 101 in the Alice decision, 103 in KSR, the law of damages, 112 and you know, reasonable certainty uh, upsetting a very long-standing uh, practice that the Federal Circuit had on insolubly ambiguous. There's just a lot of ways to lose a patent case today uh, compared to several years ago. And then the granddaddy of them all is eBay, which took away the United States' ability to basically have injunctions for most non-practicing entities. Um, and that has, that has created a shift that elongates the time to money, uh, has litigation take longer and typically run more expensive, uh, and a greater probability that you're going to lose as a patentee. So that's just the new normal, uh, and investors are cognizant of that, and they expect uh, higher quality assets and better returns as a result of that environment. You mentioned the law around Section 101 of U.S. Patent Act. That obviously involves patentability. It's a fundamental piece of so much that underpins um, actually what we're talking about here yeah. this week. There's so much confusion there. Um, I've heard you speak about the confusion there, the uncertainty around the law in that area. With all of that uncertainty, therefore, how do you get comfortable with the investments you're making in a particular case, which ultimately depend on the quality of the patent involved. Yeah, um, it, this is not a change from the last year when I said something similar. We don't currently invest in software claims that are vulnerable to 101, which is the vast, vast majority of software claims. And it's because of the uncertainty that you just flagged. We're comfortable embracing risk. That's the business that we're in. Every patent case is risky. But we're not comfortable embracing risk where we can't even get our hands wrapped around the standard for determining who's going to win. Uh, and at present, the standard for software claims under Alice uh, is really indecipherable, at least to me. You know, what constitutes an abstract idea and do the claim limitations add significantly more to that abstract idea? That's gobbledygook. Um, it, it's very much an I know it when I see it test. I've looked, and I'm sure others at this conference have looked at the Federal Circuit decisions that have come down since the Supreme Court announced Alice, um, and I can't tell in in advance which cases are going to win and which cases are going to lose. I can't tell the difference between DDR, which found claims patent eligible under 101, and the myriad of other Federal Circuit decisions that have found claims unpatentable under 101. Until I've got more of a sense of the parameters, the rules of the road, it's not a risk that we're willing to underwrite. What would need to change for your view to change, particularly with software patents? Do you need the sort of counter case to Alice? From the Supreme Court? or uh, It doesn't need to be that extreme. I think we need the Federal Circuit, or preferably the Supreme Court, but let's say the Federal Circuit, to announce a clear test applying Alice uh, that isn't just fact-specific or claim-specific. 
So something that adds more meat on the bones behind this abstract idea test, which again, to, to my lights, uh, is not a test that you can apply ex ante with any certainty. You've obviously clerked for a Supreme Court Justice. You've worked in private practice. Um, now, when you look at the entirety of, of the Roberts Court's jurisprudence and patents, um, I, I guess dating back to the eBay case in 2006, how do you assess it? Where has it left the market? Um, or has it left the law, I should say? It's left patents as a left, less valuable asset than before the Roberts Court. Um, I think every case that the court has decided has gone against the patentee, except for uh, recently the Kamel case, um, which said that you don't need to, uh, that infringement and validity are essentially different defenses, so a good faith validity defense uh, doesn't, doesn't get you out of jail free. Um, but aside from Kamel, uh, the trend has not been friendly to patentees, um, whether it's Alice, whether it's Myriad, whether it's KSR, uh, whether it's Biosig, whether it's Octane. Um, you know, the Supreme Court has taken a dim view uh, of certain patents, and even in the Kamel opinion, both the concurrence, or sorry, both the majority uh, and the dissenting opinions point out that uh, non-practicing entities are a potential problem and the courts have tools to redress the problems that they create. It was completely gratuitous. It had nothing to do with the case that was in front of the court. So I think the court is a product of the environment that we're all in. They hear the same rhetoric that other people do. Uh, and the patent community hasn't done as good a job as maybe it should to be organized and point out to the public that patents actually serve an extremely useful economic function. In the Commel case, were you surprised that Justice Scalia took the opportunity to reference patent trolls for the, uh, for the first time in the Supreme Court case? I, I won't say I was surprised. I was, I was disappointed. Um, it's not a term that I choose to use. It's obviously a pejorative. It's, it's, um, it's unfortunate that that's found its way into the U.S. reports. Looking at the bigger picture around patent litigation, it's um, trending down. It trended down um, last year. It came back in the first few months of this year, but it's a, it's a sort of wavy line at, at the moment. Um, you, we hear a lot of companies saying we want to move away from litigation. We hear MPEs doing it, whether they can or not is, is, is another matter. Yeah, but, good luck. But, <laughs> Um, but, so how do you assess the opportunities for you given, given that backdrop? Uh, the opportunities for us have not dipped uh, with the dip in patent litigation. Um, and maybe it's self-interested for me to say given the business that we're in, although I don't think so. Um, to me, the value of a patent is the expected value of the litigation proceeds that you can generate from it discounted to today uh, with a healthy discount rate for the time value of money. Um, particularly in this environment, defendants are not going to settle with you without litigation unless they're quite confident that you're going to bring that litigation and then they're quite confident that they face risk in that litigation. So the days of just licensing without a, without a law firm in the wings ready to file a complaint, I think those days are by and large over. Um, so I'm not surprised that you saw a dip in patent litigation in the wake of Alice because software uh, comprises so many of the recently issued patents uh, that people needed to take stock of where they were and assess whether it made sense to invest the dollars to litigate. Um, but at the end of the day, if you can't monetize without litigation and you're holding these assets, unless you want to write them off, litigation is kind of your only bet. It's not the, it's the best of all the bad options, I think, at this point. So uh, I'm not surprised that you saw a dip, and I'm not surprised that you've seen it tick back up. How have you reacted to the shift in, in loser pays? We've seen an increase post-Octane and Highmark in the Supreme Court. We expect something. Um, in Washington and the next stage of reform to cover loser pays. So how do you react to that, shift your business or adapt the business to it? Well, we've actually started a, an affiliated business line to address precisely that, uh, that new dynamic. So Athena FSP, FSP stands for fee shifting protection, is a product that we offer. It's affiliated with Gershon Keller uh, that provides patentees with $3 million in adverse fee and cost under 285 protection in exchange for a percentage of the recovery that the patentee ultimately generates if they're successful. So unlike a traditional insurance product where you pay the insurance company an upfront cash premium, which a lot of small inventors uh, can't afford to pay, we'll actually get paid on the back end just like a contingency firm and take our premium that way. So we've tried to react to the new normal uh, by coming up with an innovative solution that can be useful to the patent community. 
fee shifting has obviously been a part of IP law for some time. Um, we're still some way from the English system. Uh, I think most people would be very happy with that. But do you see, when you look at the trend lines, when you hear what senators and congressmen are saying on the Hill, how close do you think we might get to the English system? Pretty close. Um, so in the wake of Octane and Highmark, we're still not there, but the incidence of fees being shifted has gone up significantly. Uh, and even though Octane is a, it's a neutral decision in the sense that fees can be shifted for the defendant or for the plaintiff, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything in the statute or the opinion as to who should get the fees. The trend has been for fees to be shifted against the patentee more frequently than against the defendant. Uh, and that's particularly true for non-practicing entities. If you look at the legislation being considered in the House and Senate, there were a couple of differences between them. The House version makes fee shifting presumptive. The Senate version, it's not presumptive, but they shall be awarded if the parties took objectively unreasonable litigation positions. Uh, but a key provision in both uh, is veil piercing so that the shareholders of an LLC can be made personally liable if they don't disavow their interest. And non-practicing entities, entities that are in the business of enforcing patents or licensing, are going to have to attest under oath that they can afford to pay an adverse cost award uh, on pain of losing the ability to pursue their lawsuit if they don't make that attestation. Um, that's pretty close to the English rule, and for a lot of non-practicing entities, that's going to effectively put them out of court unless they have some other solution uh, to help shoulder the risk with them. Putting all of this together, then, most people see that patent rights swing on a pendulum, and we're, and we're, we're certainly at, at, at one end of, 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 of probably sort of, you know, weaker um, patent rights. Do, yeah. you, do you see that turning anytime soon, perhaps swinging back? Um, I see it turning in Europe, uh, and that being an attractive, more attractive place vis-a-vis -vis the United States to enforce IP rights. But um, honestly, no, I don't see the pendulum swinging back domestically. Um, we've just been talking about legislative reform in Congress. Um, there are some aspects of, for example, the Senate bill that I actually think are, are needed and um, would help restore some balance. But Like which ones? Uh, the fixes to the IPR process. So the Senate language uh, eliminates the broadest reasonable construction, which a lot of people have justly, in my mind, complained about. Um, and it offers an opportunity for the patentee, a meaningful opportunity for the patentee to amend claims uh, as of right. Uh, it makes some other tweaks around the margins. Uh, for example, you'll have, uh, instead of the same examiner who instituted your IPR also uh, being on the panel and exclusively deciding your fate, having two new uh, PTAB examiners that would have to sit on the trial part so you get fresh eyes and, and less of a bias uh, in favor of invalidating claims. So the Senate version makes meaningful strides, I think, to uh, make the process more balanced and the playing field more fair. But there are also some other provisions like we've just been talking about on fee shifting that specifically target non-practicing entities that I think still demonstrates we're in a, a pretty hostile environment. Um, when NPEs are considered sort of a, a nasty troll and you know, not a, a viable part of our economy, I think we've, we've missed, uh, as a patent community, an opportunity to explain to the public exactly what a patent is and the useful function that it's served uh, for hundreds of years. So. Do you see more opportunities there for your business, for your business outside of the U.S.? Uh, yeah, so we're, we're already looking at opportunities abroad, um, particularly where an injunction is the preferred remedy when you've demonstrated infringement and have a valid patent. Um, so we do think that there are opportunities in Europe and the move to the, uh, the unified patent system in Europe, which is expected notwithstanding Spain's objection uh, either next year or in 2017, also I think augurs well for Europe being a, a good place to enforce patent rights.